Christian M. Aberystwyth University Department of International Politics. I'm not a scientist, but I mean well. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in genetics and genomics uh, from a security perspective, um, and in particular from an arms control perspective, which is a, actually a really awkward perspective from which to come at the problem that I'm going to be talking about. But I think like everyone here today at this very timely conference, um, I'm very much interested in investigation and the, the manipulation, really, of, of life at the molecular level and the challenges and opportunities that this poses, opportunities for individual and global health, but benefits as well as risks within contemplation. And many people have observed, myself included, that advances in gene technology are precipitating a shift or at least an expansion in arms control policy making away from the what and towards the how, uh, from the tangible to the intangible. There's a, there's a very old saying you might have heard, uh, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And the person who is taught how to fish can teach someone else and so on and so forth. And so this idea that technology is intangible and nevertheless tradable is, is far from new. But in the biological realm, what is new is the way in which arms control policy and law has tried to reach in and take regulatory control to an extent uh, of, of what uh, is going on. So from a concern exclusively with materials, now increasingly to a concern also for um, methods. So in the, in, in the good old bad old days, if you were an arms control practitioner, policy maker, you were in the business of worrying about where missile components were being transported around the world. Um, quantities of highly enriched uranium or plutonium for a nuclear weapons program potentially. Um, what were these physical quantities, where they, were, where they were going, who was receiving them and so forth. But very recently, in fact I'd say as recently as September of last year, as a matter of arms control practice as well as arms, arms control law, and I think arms control law could also be called arms control theory. As a matter of arms control practice, the publication of research findings in the life sciences has become an arms control issue. And it sits really awkwardly, and, and I'm going to try and talk you through um, how we might uh, think about this. And in particular, we face a situation where a national government may prohibit publication of information on how to create a microorganism with particular genetic characteristics. And they would prohibit that for national security reasons. There is currently a case ongoing in the Netherlands, a case before the Dutch Court of Appeal, as to whether or not a particular piece of research, particular research findings, ought to have been um, uh, subjected to a requirement for government permission for publication. And there's a legal issue that I'd like to uh, concentrate on, um, leading into an ethical issue that is, a, is a much uh, for you to think about uh, as well. <coughs> so a little bit about the legal dimension and then finish off with a bold policy prescription that will probably make your blood boil. <laughs> so, um, a biosecurity dilemma. This, uh, this is a publication cited at the bottom here that appeared in Science, eventually, in June of 2012, um, published by a team from the Netherlands, the lead author here highlighted um, Ron Fouchier at the Erasmus Medical Center um, in Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. Um, and this is an extract here from the abstract of their paper to address the concern that the virus could acquire this ability, airborne transmission under natural conditions. We genetically modified H5N1 virus by site-directed mutagenesis and subsequent serial passage in ferrets. The genetically modified H5N1 virus acquired mutations during passage in ferrets ultimately becoming airborne transmissible in ferrets. Now, for those of you who don't live and breathe influenza research, what happens in ferrets is very interesting because a ferret's respiratory system is very similar to, to humans and the implication of this is ferret to ferret airborne transmissible. It strongly suggests human to human airborne transmissible. What we might in layman's term call 
a new pandemic influenza virus. And years previously, the National Academy of Sciences had published a report um, describing research that involved deliberately causing a particular organism to become more transmissible was an experiment of concern. And nowadays, it would be referred to as dual-use research of concern, as, as Katrina said uh, before lunch. Now, onto the scene, and although this publication did eventually come out, it was in fact published, um, things might not have gone that way. Things might not have gone that way. This could have been censored, as it were, because who should turn up but the Dutch government? Mm -hmm. And the Dutch government was wielding arms control laws that hitherto had not touched the publishing world when it comes to the life sciences. And I'm going to take you through why it is that Ron Fouchier is currently taking the Dutch government to court. So, you might not be interested in law, but law is interested in you. I will try to be gentle. <laughs> Behold, European Union Council Regulation 428-2009. A fairly new piece of law, and it was wielded in April 2012 by the Dutch government to require Ron Fouchier to apply for permission to publish his research findings. Now this regulation covers dual use items, which critically includes in the definition here, not just item items, touchable, but technology. And dual use, which can be used for both civil and military purposes. And the regulations stipulate an authorization shall be required for export of the dual use items listed in Annex 1, and I'm going to take you through that ever so gently shortly. Export includes publication as we'll see. Export means transmission of software or technology by electronic media. Read through there. Fax, telephone, email. And then that final sentence, oral transmission of technology when the technology is described over the telephone. This is exports. This is the stuff of export controls. And this applies to Ron Fouchier talking about his findings over the telephone, just as it applies to sending a manuscript to the editor of science. The regulation tells us that technology for the purposes of this law also well, it encompasses technical data and technical assistance. And technical data is what we're uh, fixated on here. And behold, a small bit of the sacred list, the stuff that is covered by this export control security oriented uh, regulation. A very long list of dual use items. Category 1 is special materials. And under list 1C352, animal pathogens, including point A there, viruses, whether natural, enhanced, or modified. And included among the viruses, avian influenza virus of high pathogenicity, and H5 is presumed to be in that category. This was the stuff that Fouchier's team was working on. It looks like, at first blush, his work is captured by the export control regulations. He needs to ask permission before he transmits his technology to anyone outside Europe. But is there perhaps an out for Ron? Well, the regulations do not apply if a scientist is engaged in basic scientific research. So the question for the court, the Dutch court, um, when Ron Fouchier challenged the Dutch government's decision to require him to ask the permission to publish was, was he engaged in basic or applied scientific research? Because the law tells us that basic scientific research means experimental or theoretical work undertaken principally to acquire new knowledge of the fundamental principles of phenomena or observable facts, not primarily directed towards a specific aim or objective. And the court supported the government's decision to characterize his research as applied, not basic research, and therefore he was not able to access this exception to the law. And the court also held that it's not good enough for Fouchier and his team to say that from their perspective the research was basic. No, the court made that decision, or at least it backed up the assessment that was made by the government as to whether this was basic or applied research. And this is a really interesting 
um, side issue amongst all the tumult that has surrounded this case, because it occasions us to think again in a security context, what counts as basic research and what counts as applied. So let me take you ever so quickly through uh, four questions that I think um, need to be asked by researchers and would-be publishers of findings such as those that Fouchier's team produced. First of all, we might ask ourselves, is an expert export permit required to publish this research data? Uh, we could tell ourselves no, because it doesn't relate to anything that is on the magic list, the very long list, so we go ahead and publish. Or we tell ourselves no, a permit is not required because the scientific research is clearly basic, although perhaps our thoughts about what counts as basic are being challenged now. But if we do think that a, a permit is required, or we're, if we're unsure, then we approach the government, we the researcher, or we the journal editor. And then, when the government is considering should publication go ahead, the question will be, what matters most? What will be our point of reference? Or at least, what will be our major point of reference? Is this about scientific freedom? Is this about the individual professional interests of scientific researchers? Perhaps, I suggest, the principal point of reference should be public health because in circumstances like this there is a public health imperative to restrict the dissemination of information because you're concerned about accidents or deliberate misuse of technology causing a public health burden. But there's also a public health imperative to permit dissemination of information which could lead to life-saving <coughs> discoveries and the betterment um, and prolongation of human life. And having decided if we want to do that, that public health will be our major point of reference, we then talk ourselves through the benefits and risks of disseminating the research. Um, and this will be a far from scientific pro uh, process. We could hope for quantifiable risks, quantifiable benefits to be within contemplation. But because it's a government decision, we have to account for the possibility that this will be politicised, a political decision will be made as to whether the benefits outweigh uh, the risks. But again, it's a weighing process rather than a process of simply prohibiting publication because there is some risk at all. Okay. I'm now winding up and approaching the, the guillotine moment. The final question, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Um, simple and elegant to ask that <coughs> question very difficult to operationalize and to justify because opinions will differ. Sure, the benefits outweigh the risks. Go ahead with publication. We'll give you a permit. We could judge, however, that the benefits do not outweigh the risks. And I submit that the Dutch government could have made that determination in respect of Ron Fouchier's findings, uh, not least because when those findings were debated at the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity in the United States, where science is published, Fully one third of the members of that board thought that it was too dangerous for, this, for these findings to be disseminated. What if instead of having this binary choice, very ruthless and stark, we had a third option for governments that might in some way go to reassuring scientists and journal editors? Might we not engage in what I call discrete dissemination? Now, when Fouchier's manuscript was being discussed in various um, quarters, the suggestion usually was, why don't we publish without the methods section? The how being removed from the, the description of what was going on. And that was hugely controversial. I'll skip over a slide here and bring us mercifully towards the end and explain why discrete uh, dissemination um, could work and how it would work, what would be the principles that guide it. I would say that discrete dissemination involves disseminating research findings only to the people who need to receive them for public health reasons. The major principled objection to censorship by journal editors and scientists has been if you stop publication, people are going to miss out on health enhancing opportunities. So, discrete dissemination has to be based on and justified by public health imperatives. It would be applicable only to research findings that have already been subjected to peer review. So this is about discreetly disseminating good science. And all the costs would be borne by the government that is imposing this limitation on dissemination. It's not censorship, it's not full publication, it's discrete dissemination. And the cost of doing this would be borne by the government. What would be the costs? Sorting out who is going to receive this information. 
and I'm suggesting that it should be distributed possibly to, to hundreds of other influenza researchers around the world, but which is nevertheless far fewer recipients than the hundreds of thousands of people who read science. That there should be attached uh, to this dissemination a, a statement from a journal editor saying that this has passed peer review, again on scientific quality, and to finish up, just a reassurance that we are still in the realm of security, that discrete dissemination should also include distributing simultaneously these research findings to every state that is a member of the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention. Because the advantage of discrete dissemination over outright censorship is that other countries will not be concerned <coughs> that you are withholding information, keeping it to yourself, so as to gain a technological advantage in some kind of biological arms race. Thank you.